Thank you guys for tuning in. This is episode 21 of Coaching Connections. Today I had the chance to sit and talk to Coach Bill Avey and Coach Ryan Pertel. Now both of these guys are, are two guys I call friends. Um, they're phenomenal people, outstanding human beings. They, uh, they had great careers and they have now moved into the world of administration and they're doing wonderful things for the schools that they work at. Um, we talked about their journeys throughout the, their time as coaches. We talked about their love for the game of basketball. We discussed their love for empowering the youth in the schools that they work at, and which is what makes them great at their job. And so this episode was very beneficial for all that, uh, that take the time to listen to it. I hope you find it as useful as I did. These guys are just outstanding human beings again. Um, thank you for your time. This is episode 21, Coaching Connections. Coach Ryan Pertel, Coach Bill Avey. Let's get after it. What's up, Marcus? How you doing, Coach? How are you, buddy? Oh, I'm great, Coach. I, mean, I cannot complain a bit. Got the got the got the full beard going now, right? It's actually only a couple of weeks. It goes back so fast. I know you. I, I'll see you sometimes, and you have like a little shadow, and sometimes it's longer, and sometimes you're clean. Summertime it goes faster. Yeah. Summertime is when I don't don't like to shave too often. Yeah, it just gets <laughs> so stinking hot, you know. Yeah, but I mean. Especially with everything going on, I just stay indoors most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I have she's my son has an autoimmune uh, deficiency, so I don't go anywhere, man. Play I'm smart. just got to play smart. You know, he he just can't fight off stuff like that. So yeah, and it seems like things are getting kind of worse out there. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, but um, yeah, as far as the situation out there, but I uh. Man, I've been doing virtual teacher interviews for two days, and woo! All through Zoom or what? Uh, Zoom or Google? Meet, Google Meets. Mm -hmm. Google Meets, but man, I'm We're like, talking. I'm like brain dead, man. I'm just like <laughs> asking the same questions over and over. Yeah. Uh, we uh we start. I think uh, August fifth will be the first day of school for the kids. That's what was proposed and passed, so we'll see unless things change. So far, we haven't announced that we're starting that early. We're, you know, we're still planning on starting, I think, you know, normal time. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I think that'll change. And then it's really going to be up to the directions of the virus. CDC and, yeah. and you know, um, I don't know about y'all, but, like, our one of our biggest challenges is that, 90% of the kids with ISD ride the school bus. Yeah. So, you know, and we never have enough, we yeah. never have enough drivers. So how do you social distance on the school bus? Whew. How do you make sure kids are all wearing their masks? You know, um, oh, this is such are they going to be screened before they get on the school bus? Are they going to be screened when they get to school and then have to call parents to come get them if they have a temperature? Um, it's just there's a lot of little logistical things that sometimes, you know, not everybody thinks about. Um, Uncharted waters and unprecedented times, and, and there's no playbook for this, right? I mean, there's – Yeah. I mean, nothing. there's no precedent for it at all. And, um, so, I don't know. It's, it's just weird times, buddy. It's weird times. So, what's the team going to look like next year? Pretty good? Yeah, we got to – I mean, if you get to play, <laughs> you yeah. know. I was just talking about that with uh, the coach at Harlan. <laughs> yeah, if if they allow us to have a season. Um, I'm texting for Terry now. Um, if they allow us to have a season, we have – I mean, everybody – just about everybody coming back, you know. Um, you know, our, our, our three top scorers are coming back. Um, Fantastic. Experience. Yeah. Oh. Well, you do a great you do a great job with 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 your kids. So whatever you have, I know you're gonna get the most out of them. So I appreciate it. And then so we got some talent coming back, and I'm excited. No, uh, just hoping we can uh yeah play. You know, hoping we we can have a season, even if there's no nobody in the stands and no fans. Yeah, you know, just as long as it's safe for the kids. You know. I mean the UI the the UIL is very optimistic. Yeah, a lot of the pro sport, a lot of the sports that have started back, they're already having issues because i thought for sure the golf would be like the safest you know to start playing and now we've got people testing positive i don't know if they canceled the tournament this week or not they 
there's supposed to be a press conference at two. I didn't see it. Um, you know, and I'm a golf nut, so that's a big deal to me. I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I watch golf even when there's all kinds of sports to watch. On yeah. TV. Yeah. My dad now, obviously with not much to watch. I'm going to watch golf. <laughs> <laughs> He's been trying, my dad's been trying to get me to golf for the longest. Uh, I said, dad, as long as I can shoot a jump shot, I'm going to go shoot a couple jump shots. And yeah, hopefully your body will hold up better than mine has over the, over the years. My, <laughs> I don't have my knees and ankles are pretty well shot. So yeah, uh, playing basketball is, has been, uh, Long time I haven't been able to play basketball. There he is. The legend himself. Look at that. Ken Ears. What was it? It was Ryan J. Pertel, Esquire, former head golf coach, Southwest High School. Was that it? For that? that is my uh, – if I ever attend the court uh, in Britain – and I appear before the queen, that's how I'll be introduced. Oh, <laughs> I, I will be there as a character witness. That's my, that's my formal, you know, if I have to meet before the king or queen and they announce you, you got those guys with the big hats, you know, and they yeah. get everybody's attention, that's how I'll be introduced. <laughs> doesn't matter what happens in my life, honestly, beyond that. That's, that's it. That's clearly, me. clearly. I'm with you on that, Coach. I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on. <laughs> <laughs> while you were saying all that <laughs> so the bit is the bit is marcus that i would do is when bill and i were working together those three years the last two years my good friend matt elliott said would you please be the head golf coach <laughs> in addition to be the head basketball coach and so i thought it would be funny that whenever the phone rang on my desk in the office and i knew who it was that i would answer it ryan j Fertel esquire head golf coach southwest high school yeah <laughs> for two years yeah two years it, then all we had to do is add the word former and now it just keeps going it just it, it, it's stuck man yes <laughs> i'm yes. Have to change the name in my phone that's it yeah i was the worst golf coach in 6a sports <laughs> <laughs> i don't know about that coach well that's debatable i'll be honest with you i went through a few tournaments and started after I saw a couple, I was like, hey, I'm not that bad. But, but no, uh, yeah, uh, no, we're right. There, there may be some other contenders out there. <laughs> They're probably still coaching golf, too. Well, yes, they probably still are. You're right. Well, well guys, I appreciate you all taking time out of your day. I know it's uh, – you guys are pretty busy. I know, like you said, uh, Coach Bertel had, had a lot of work today. Coach Avey, you know, a lot of interviews over the internet. And so the fact that you guys took some time out to hang out and talk about sports and in life, I, I do appreciate it. It's truly Perfect. my pleasure. So for those that don't know, we have a uh, – I'm going to say your regular name. We have Coach Ryan Patel here on the bottom and Coach Bill Avey, uh, although his screen says Wavy. Wavy, yeah. I'm going uh... <laughs> <laughs> to call you Wavy, Coach. Smash out. <laughs> People call me that all the time. So you guys doing all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. You know, uh, usually I ask about – Lockdown, how's that been? You know, but lockdown's been been uh, lifted a while back, and we've kind of been working a little bit. So uh, just maybe tell me about how life's a little different for you now that with everything going on with this state of the world and COVID. Um, you want to go first, Ryan, or you want me to? Go ahead, buddy. Okay. Well, you know, at first we were in phase three, and basically nobody was going to campus. I mean, like you had to have permission – from the principal to even go to campus. And so we had a couple of things that we did. You know, we went for a couple of days to issue technology to students because they were going to be, you know, doing it at home. And then a few weeks later, we went in for senior cap and gown curbside issue. Um, and then, you know, in June, until the spike came back, um, we had a modified schedule, you know, uh, the APs, we, we had a schedule, but we were in all day, every day. Um, and then our office staff was coming in and man, the spike came up and, and now it's, uh, basically if you can do it from home, do it from home. Um, and it's just, it, it's, it starts hitting you when, you know, you have four custodians in a week that had positive tests, you know, um, and it just starts hitting you, uh, how real, um, this thing truly is. And, and sometimes, you know, 
you, even when you watch the TV a little bit and you just go, oh, maybe it's not quite what it was. It's just kind of struck um, home um, a lot of reality. And I think it's made a lot of people uh, sit back and, and um, check their priorities a little bit. You know, um, I know I'm, I, I've always been a family man. Don't get me wrong, but man, that time with my family is even more important now. You know, absolutely. Um, you know, family-wise, it's been weird. You know, to have a, a house full of uh, kids. Uh, you know, Marcus, you and Bill both have a wife and kids at home, and and know that you know watching them kind of adjust to you know, like Bill referenced the up and down of all of this. And, you know, uh, it's been interesting and in trying to be a good husband and a good father in the midst of all of that. And then uh, to set as a, a campus principal and try to work on some formulation of some idea um, of what the, the 2021 school district is going to uh, school year, excuse me, is going to look like, um, man, you talking about, it's not just shooting at a moving target. You feel like you're shooting at a moving target and you're blindfolded. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, working on the things you can work on and, and learning to accept the ones that you can't, and, uh, it's been interesting. Yeah. yeah. Just like, I mean, for me, one of my side duties this year was, was textbooks. Well, you know, the school was shut down for four months. Normally the way that happens is you have students help and then, when I finally was able to go back to work, I scanned 6,600 books in two days. Yeah. You know what I mean, so ju it's just little things like that, that have just went, you know, kind of out of whack and, and, you know, we just do what we have to do to get, to get the job done. Um, but as far as the principal goes, principal thing goes, I know as an AP, that moving target with the blindfold is very true. I can't even imagine what principals and senior leadership and districts are going through. I mean, it's just, um, you have to have multiple plans for, you know, when you're going to start back, how you're going to start back, how you're going to execute it. Um, and it's really uh, reshaped, uh, I think, the thinking of how leadership on educational level really works, you know. For sure. And like, like we said earlier, uh, Bill, um, no, there's no playbook for this. There's no precedence. There's no uh, nothing in past history tells us what to do next and how to how to move forward in a situation like this. We're just kind of trying to figure it out as we go along. So, so we appreciate you guys and senior leadership uh, figuring out for us. <laughs> don't, hey, don't brag on us until you see what we come up with, man. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> We're yeah. doing the best we can. That's all I can. Across, day -day. Ac across the country, uh, yeah. school leaders are doing the best they can. Uh, my, yeah. My brother is, is, is a administrator in, in Western Maryland and, it, they're going through the same things. You know, they, there's not as many, they don't have the population that we have. So they don't have the amount of cases that we have like in, in Bear County, but mm -hmm. yeah, they're still going through the same things. Yep. Speaking on that, like what, what is your guys thoughts on the, you know, the, the spike in numbers and, you know, like you said, it's, it's, it's very real and it's starting to become more real for more people. I, I had a good friend of mine that, that was just hospitalized and he got out and he's feeling a little better, but to kind of see someone, you know, pretty close go through it, you know, it does uh, make life in, in these times, uh, it makes you realize it is, it is real and it's not just something you see on the news. I try not to speak for scientists. I think we've got too many people who've decided in the midst of this crisis that they are armchair scientists. Yeah. Um, I do think, though, in general, um, Bear County was kind of like a statistical outlier for a long time. Like you could see what was going on around our state. Um, and so it's really probably not super surprising that eventually it happened. I mean, you put a million and a half people together with a respiratory disease spread the way it spreads. It's probably more, it was probably always a matter of, of when and not if. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but hopefully, hopefully people are seeing the numbers the, and taking it. The two things that we know God, we them are effective and in uh, preventing the spread or wearing masks and social distancing. Um, and I see that's hit and miss, yeah. you know, the, the little bit that I'm actually out and about. 
Um, but I would encourage, you know, we need to continue with those things. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't envy politicians right now because Mm -hmm. I mean, the economy is the economy, man, you know, and they gotta, they gotta consider trying to keep the economy on track when to allow, you know, things to go back to normal. And it's very easy for people to sit and say that in Texas, we initiated, you know, um, things a little early, but you know, man, that's, that's a tough call. So, um, and I'm with Ryan, I, I, as far as the scientific stuff goes anymore, I, man, there's so many different things you hear. It's hard. It's hard to sort it all out. I just know it's everything I'm hearing, wearing a mask, social distancing, and that's what I'm trying to do. Yep. Which is wise. And I think, uh, as coaches or former coaches, um, we get an appreciation for, you know, people telling us how to do our job better than, than we can yeah. in situations. And so I, I, I'm not going to try to act like a, a doctor or a scientist or a, or a politician for that matter. Those guys have their own jobs and they know more about it than I do. And um, so I'm going to let them do what they do. And, uh, and I saw this meme. It was pretty funny on, on social media. It was like the hierarchy of education. And it said like, uh, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school diploma, um, you know, a bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctors. And at the very top of the pyramid, it said a uh, social media degree or something like that. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> it yeah. was pretty funny. Pretty funny. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your childhood. You know, any influences in your life? Uh, where'd you grow up? Um, what kind of sent you down this path towards education and, and coaching? Go ahead, Bill. Um, I, I grew up in Western Maryland. Um, and, my first and still my hero is my father. I, 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 I always thought I've always felt like I've had a great work ethic and I got that from him as well as just love of people. Um, as, as far as I knew from the age, from the fourth grade, I wanted to be a basketball coach. Um, when I was in this aid, um, ironically, I mean, we, we had this big field day and there was a bunch of my, classmates who were girls and they wanted to put a team into the little basketball tournament they were doing with field day, which was, you know, this is like 1975, right? Um, that was very unheard of. And guess who their coach was? Me. (laughs) And so, I mean, that's how I got started coaching girls. It was kind of weird when I think back, um, we actually finished third in that tournament. I was pretty proud of them. Um, and then from there, you know, the Air Force called and I, I decided I thought I was going to go in for four years and come out and do what I always knew I wanted to do. And that was coach and teach. And uh, 21 years later, I retired. Um, I loved it. And then I had the opportunity to uh, teach and coach um, at Southwest High School. And even before that, you talk about the luckiest guy who's ever lived. Um, how many people have you ever known who are active duty military and a head basketball coach at a high school? That's the break I got yeah. in the late nineties with incarnate word high school. Um, I was, you know, I was the head coach there while I was still on active duty military. And, and I, quite frankly, the success I had there was what got me the job at, at Southwest. Um, I'm just a very lucky and blessed man. Um, so I'm born and raised Texas, Marcus. Um, the, um, now not, you know, not San Antonio, San Antonio has become my adopted home, but live mostly in North Texas, uh, the Metroplex area. Um, as far as, you know, influence that would shape my career. Uh, my mom was, my dad wasn't educated. My mom was, but really her career as a teacher really never was the thing that connected me. Um, What really connected me um, to wanting to go down that path. The only reason why, the reason why I'm sitting here right now as a high school principal, the initial motivation was 100% because I love basketball. I wanted to make my career around. And that evolved into what I am, the role I'm in now, because the love of basketball grew to just a love of education, a love of, of, of high schools, high school kids and, and high school teachers and trying to help people be successful. So, you know, it really, it was, it was, that was it. I mean, I want to be a basketball coach. That's why I 
went into education. Me, me too. Uh, the, the teaching was honestly, I'm just being candid. The teaching at that time was an afterthought. Um, now I'm in a place where I, my, my favorite instruction, my, my favorite conversations are, or how does how does the instructional process work and how is it how's it effective how do we make sure that a kid walks into a room not knowing something and walks out knowing it um i'm enthralled by that but that was not my motivation to get in it i wanted to coach ball period me too and, and so your journey let's go back to coach av you were at in Carnival high school yes sir um, and then southwest and then southwest yeah i had a i had a year off um so in 2003 i got reassigned to uh, Oklahoma, which at Tinker, that's where I retired out of. So I was the head coach at, at Incarnate Word from 1998 through the 2002-2003 um, season. And I'll never forget the phone call I got. You know, I had, I had my daughter was, was a really good basketball player, and I had a very successful AAU program. And, and um, I had just got back from one of those grueling weekend tournaments, and I get this phone call from a parent that I knew from Incarnate Word, and he's like, hey, Bill, uh, um, Jerry Gonzalez um, just resigned, and he took a, a job at Antonian. Would you be interested maybe in talking to us about being the head girls basketball coach? And at the time, I saw how naive I was. I didn't realize at private school, you didn't have to be a teacher. You didn't have to be certified. It was like a part-time job. And so after they explained that to me, I said, sure. And so – I remember showing up for the interview. I was in my military uniform. It was like on my lunch break. Um, <laughs> drove over from Lackland, and bam, next thing you know, I got the job. And they were just five golden years. And, um, man, it was, it was that, that, that's still a very special place for me. Not as special as uh, Southwest ISD, but very, very special place for me, Incarnate Word. And how many years at Southwest ISD did you coach? Um, I, this is my, I just finished my uh, 17th year um with the district and I coached for 14. Gotcha. Coach Patel? Oh, you want like the, the coaching resume? Yes, sir. Um so started out, first gig was middle school. Um and then I was at a small school district, Glen Rose ISD. Um and uh and but it was really good too because but in small schools, they leverage their middle school coaches a lot more. They have to. It's a resource uh, to work with the high school program. And so if you got a straight-up basketball guy in a middle school job, you're going to use him. And there were really good coaches there. A um, guy by the name of Kenny Hoffpower, still coaching, he's got like a 1,000 wins or something ridiculous like that, uh, was the head coach at Glen Rose at the time. And uh, he, as soon as he realized I was a basketball guy, I mean, he – He'd have me scouting. He did. I, I, I can still remember to this day, and I, I cannot recommend this kind of stuff enough to coaches who are in this position, but we had gone to scout a playoff opponent, and the time the Glen Rose team was ranked like second or third in the state, and we'd gone to scout a playoff p- opponent. We showed up for a Saturday practice, and uh, we're talking to, you know, head coach about what we saw because this is pre-huddle, pre-all that stuff. We actually had to go work for information. No <laughs> offense to the youngsters today, Marcus. No, I, 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 I love Just download person. it all. I love scouting in person. I'd rather scout in person. Yeah, there's a different feel to it. Uh, I'll yeah, just say yeah. that. There's a different feel to it. But, I mean, we were in a small school setting, so not only to do it, you had to drive an hour and a half one direction to get there. And so I go in, and, and so he, you know, he said, you know, he starts running me, you know, Coach Hoffbauer starts running me through a series of questions, and he's asking, and he says, all right, he goes, the team's on the floor, go tell them everything you told me. And so I went out there as a middle school coach and presented, you know, their best players and their tendencies and what they were going to do on defense, and I'm he didn't right tell me think somebody's at my door. <laughs> he didn't tell me. He didn't tell me he was going to do that. He just said, go do it. You're and, yeah, and, and, you know, I was like, all right, here we go. Um, and so – and then there was also an assistant coach that was there by the name of Jeff McDorman uh, who would become my, my biggest mentor in basketball, Jeff um, – Wimberly? Yes, sir. Okay. I know yeah. That. Yeah. So, so, so Jeff uh, – Jeff ended up leaving in there and getting head coach job at Springtown High School, uh, went forth, and he, he as soon as he had a varsity assistant position open, he – he hired me, so I got to go from Glen Rose to Springtown. Spent two really good years with with Jeff. the The basketball program had not been very successful. They'd been kind of an up and down classification school, um, and that's a tough place to be in. You know, you're 
not knowing whether you're going to be one of the biggest schools in one division or the smallest in the other. And they had moved up hmm. at the time Jeff and I were there. And uh, they had never won at that level. And we were able to, to get them on the right track. And then the year after I left, actually, I stayed for two years there. Um, the year after I left, they actually broke through and made the playoffs. It was the first time that they'd made the playoffs up at that higher division. Really good group of kids. Uh, and Jeff was a, an important mentor to me. But, I, man, I was so sure that I was just needed to be a head coach. I just needed to be a head coach so bad. I was a head coach, head coach, head coach. So I started applying for small school head coaching jobs, the kind of jobs that I would look at a guy like me with, you know, just, you know, four years and, a, you know, a couple of years of varsity assistant. And uh, so got hired down in Southeast Texas, Buna, B-U-N-A, Buna High School. Um, and a, a really good guy by the name of Bradley Morgan, athletic director, took a shot at on me, um, hired me, came in there. Uh, but it was one of those deals where, you know, you want something really, really bad. You, you don't really – you want to say yes so bad that you don't necessarily think everything through. The people of that community were fantastic. The kids were great. Uh, but they really had reached a place where the kids at the time – now, they're not that way anymore. They, they, they're playing ball, and, and they've hired a, a graduate there that's really doing good things. Um, uh, but anyway, the, the kids that I inherited, they just really weren't that into basketball. Great kids. The few of them were, but not very many of them. They were more football, baseball. And so what I felt like at the end of two years was um, they were frustrating me, but it wasn't their fault. And I was frustrating them, and it wasn't my fault. And so around that time, that's when uh, the opportunity came uh, for me to, to go to Southwest uh, Matt Elliott was the head football coach, athletic coordinator. Matt and I had worked together at Springtown. Uh, so I came in, took over a very healthy program, uh, very well run by Darren Casper, had that had been doing a lot of winning and had some players. Uh, and so, you know, was able to spend three years at Southwest. The, and I'll say this, I said this on and off record, I'll say it over and over again. I've, I've, the other places I've been in my career have been great. I've met great people everywhere, and everybody's added to my life. But the most fun I've ever had by far is the three years I was at Southwest High School as the head basketball coach and taught social studies. Just great people. We had players. We could win. Great assistants. I worked in the office there with Bill. Um, you know, and we were winning in everything. This, you know, that was, you know, we were winning in football. We were winning in baseball, softball, volleyball, boys and girls basketball. We were winning in everything, and it was just a lot of fun. Uh, then I finished my coaching career trying to get closer to family because uh, a little bit we thought that would be a, a thing. So we end up, uh, end up at Sherman, which is, you know, due north of Dallas, almost in Oklahoma. Spent two years there, had two really good years there. But at the end of that, that's when I realized I just, the itch to, the, to become a, a campus administrator was becoming strong. And that's so, you know, I always felt like once you reach that point where you're, if you're not all the way in being a coach because of the demands it makes on you, and you're feeling like you need to go another direction, then you've already answered your question. Yep. And so that's when I made the decision to, to make the move to admin. Yeah, he's going to be a superintendent someday. Oh, I'll, I'll bet you anything, Marcus. Um, and, you know, he said something that I, that I, you know, he said that he inherited a very healthy program. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this goes to being the luckiest guy in the world. That Incarnate Word program was extremely healthy. They had lost in the state championship game the previous year when I took it over. And when I took over the Southwest program, Joanne Fay, Dr. Fay, yeah. had a very healthy program, had great assistant, especially Adriana Beatrick, who we now know is at Highlands. Um, and so I was very fortunate, um, Ryan, uh, to take over two very healthy programs as well. Well, and, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a good point uh, that you brought up because the guy I followed at Sherman, uh, he recently moved into athletic administration at Allen after going to Austin a couple of times and when he could, Jeff McCulloch could flat out coach. Uh, and, and so that both of those programs were very, very healthy. Now, when I w moved into Sherman, the, they had really graduated a really strong class and headlined by a guy by the name of Cameron Clark, who would be the leading score at the University of Oklahoma the last two years he was there and yeah. his successful career in Europe. So the talent level maybe had taken a little bit of depth, but that, but they were good kids and, and we, we were able to win a few games uh, with them, including a district championship the second year I was there. Um, so, but, but man, I, I can tell you right now, both of the guys at, at the, 
the, my last two coach ups I followed were, were guys that could flat out coach basketball. Yeah. And then going back to coach, uh, to was it uh, McDormand? Yeah. Yeah, I got a chance to, to, to play against them a couple of times. Uh, uh, they needed a game. They called me my first uh, couple of years at McCollum. And so we scheduled a, a game at McCollum and a game in Wimberley. And he's, he was a great guy um, right before he's he retired. A- Go ahead, Marcus. I'm sorry. I was just saying it was right be- at the end of his career, right before he retired. Yeah, he's – Jeff McDormand is like one of the top five human beings I've ever known. Really? Um, I learned more about just how to be a man and <laughs> – and then function as a coach and a teacher in the professional environment in the right way. Be a coach in the coach's office. Be a teacher in the classroom. How to be a husband, how to be a father, all that kind of stuff. I mean, he was a, he was a mentor for me way beyond basketball. And I, I had this weird inkling his last year uh, at, at Wimberley. And, and, by the way, Jeff retired with a lot of wins. The other, the other thing, too, is the guy's an obsessive worker. So he retired and has somehow figured out how to work two jobs. He's probably working about 70 hours a week. He'll work till the day he dies. But the um, I had this weird feeling. He had a pretty good team, and they they won the first round. I can't I can't remember who they beat. Maybe maybe won the first two rounds, and they end up playing Bernie High in the third round, and they played at Smithson Valley. I said, you know what? I think he's going to retire. Yeah. And so I I went up. They played at Smithson Valley, and I watched him. And then ended up being the I got to watch the last game he coached because right. he made the decision at the end of that season to retire. So that was pretty cool. Pretty smart on your end to, to put that piece of the puzzle together and figure it out so you can go watch that game. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's – but that's that's Ryan. Ryan's Ryan's like that. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy, human being too. I got to know Jeff a little bit through Ryan, and, man, what a wonderful, wonderful man. Last time I saw him, he he came over to me. Like, he went way out of his way to come say hi and ask how I was doing and – I was like, wow, I didn't even realize he would remember me, but God, Jeff's really good people. The only problem he has is he's that jerk that can eat, you can eat with every meal during the season, and you can literally feel and see and hear yourself getting fatter, and he can just – he'll out-eat you at every meal and just stay as skinny as a rail. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, what in the world, man? But yeah. it is what it is. That's his only flaw. You know, and I didn't know him well, but just, just my experience with him, he was, he was a great guy. and. And one interesting story about Wimberley, the first time we played them, they came to McCullum. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, and, and so it was a little bit of a shock for some of the kids. You could yeah. tell them getting off the bus. But it, it, was, it was, I mean, it was, it was a fun experience, and we shot the heck out of the ball. I think we shot, honestly, I think it was 20 for 30 from the three-point line. Um, and I don't know a lot about basketball, but yeah. what I do know, it says that if you go 20 for 30 from three, You're you probably win most of those games. Yeah, we win the winning. those games and wins, yeah. And, and what was neat about it was uh, uh, about a week and a half later, I got a letter in the mail from a, a resident of Wimberley that was just real nice, real uh, complimentary on our, on our program and the boys and, and, and just everything about it. And I thought, wow, I mean, the guy didn't know who I was. Took time out of his day to Google search the, the, the name and the, the address and, and write a letter, a handwritten letter. So I don't know, I, that always just kind of stuck in my mind. And, I, cool. and, and Jeff didn't write the letter, but I just always associated the, the two for some reason. Yeah. So uh, kind of talking about coaching trees a little bit, let's talk about yours. Uh, you know, uh, you, you named uh, Coach Reatrick on your end and, and uh, you know, anybody else that, that, that you've worked with that, that is now a head coach and doing great things in a profession? Um, Anissa Hastings is uh, – as good as it gets. Um, we hired her right out of college, uh, had a great opportunity to coach her on my AU in my AAU program, um, Fox tech, then the Stevens and now at Wagner. Um, and Oh, by the way, if you haven't seen her, her daughter, LA, she's something special. She's coming soon. Um, you know, uh, Ryan Henry, who's not no longer in the profession. He was a long time assistant for me for a long time. And then, he went up to uh, to Bastrop, did a did a terrific job um, up there. Um, had another coach in my word did a job in Antonian. Um, let me see who else. Uh, Steve Bittison, he was a head coach. Came to me as an assistant. He got a, he got another head coach. Bounced around a little bit. Steve Steve had a truckload of wins. Um, 
who else? Oh, Nikki uh, Varial went to Smithson Valley. I mean, most of her time was at Warren, though, with Coach Mead. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but I've just been really blessed also to to have wonderful assistant coaches um, around me who who just bent over backwards for our kids and our program. I've always said, Marcus, that I, I'm certain I was a better assistant coach than a head coach, but the um, uh, I had unbelievable assistant coaches. Um, uh, so uh, Michael Holt uh, was the first assistant I had when I came to Southwest, and he's been a head coach now at a few different places out in Alabama and that in the South, he, he relocated out there uh, for family reasons and is doing well out there. Um, and then uh, was able to hire uh, Reggie Olandike and uh, hired him out of the Northside Middle Schools. Uh, really, you know, I feel like plucked a gym there. Uh, uh, I mean, he's another one of those guys like McDormand that eats whatever he wants. So I don't know. He's, he don't trust him. He's a little more shady, but the, uh, but, and then, you know, through that, Marcus, I, I, because Reggie and I were so close and still are, I mean, somehow I've, I, I guess against better judgment, I've hired him once again, and he works for me at Stevens. Uh, but I claim his tree too, yourself included. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I had Reggie, and Reggie was great. And then when I went up to Sherman, um, I had a whole slew of guys that were really good coaches. I mean, I had a whole team of them. Um, uh, Taylor Wilson's coaching up in Frisco. Last I heard, Taylor was still an assistant, but I think it's just a matter of time for him, for he's a head coach. And then uh, my first assistant, Chad Rochelle, has been a head coach at Hera High School in Oklahoma, uh, near Oklahoma City, and has been to the state tournament a couple of times. And, and Coach Brady Manick, that plays for uh, University of Oklahoma right now. Uh, Chad, just a, another, like, right up there with Jeff McDormand is just being a great human being. Yeah. But I had great, I had great assistants all the way through, uh, guys that really, really um, did a lot to help support everything we did. Oh, their assistants are, are so important, which is why I'm, I'm in the search right now as we speak. You know, going through, uh, you know, people interested in, in, in I remember uh, my time as an assistant and just how valuable they can be and, and, and what they bring to the program. And so, uh, so I just, my guy, I'm. Only six years in as a head coach, you know, so my, my coaching tree is a little baby tree over here. And so so my guy just got a head coaching job. So I'm super happy for him. That's good. That's Hopefully awesome. my, my branches can keep going like like you guys. <laughs> coach Bertel, let's talk a little bit about how coaching has helped you uh, in the role that you serve now as principal. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's a layer of responsibility um, – that that coaches take on um, that doesn't make them in and of themselves uh, any more qualified to be a campus administrator than a really good teacher, but the experience is valuable. Um, and so, and I will tell you too, and the, the three guys in this conversation know, there's also too a big difference between the assistant role and being a head coach too. Uh, but there's a lot of things you have to do. You have to deal with uh, management of parents, management of staff, you know, you're now you may only have one dude, depending on what school district you're at, but you got an assistant and that assistant works for you. Uh, and so if you, you know, if I'm sitting over here, Ryan Patel, the social studies uh, teacher, there's nobody in that building that works for me. Um, but if I have assistant or assistants, or like at the end when at Sherman, when I was incredibly blessed for, um, those are four people that I have to learn how to manage. And honestly, when you get down to the core of what it takes to be an administrator and what it takes to effective administrator, and what it takes to be a, a campus principal, you know, like at Stevens, you know, got about 180 teachers alone, close to about 300 staff. It's, it's really about the ability to manage people. You have to deal with a lot more um, conflict. You have to be able to come through things with people. Uh, if you had that coaching experience where they may not like exactly the choices you're making and you've got to be able to, to respond to them in a way that, that keeps them on board. Uh, um, and, and and you have to have a level of discipline with kids. That the rank and file uh, teacher doesn't have the opportunity to experience that, um, and so it it just it gives you a whole other level. You know, people talk, well, you had a budget to manage. Listen, let me tell you something. 
what it takes to manage a, a high school basketball program's budget is like comparing a two-story house to the Empire State Building compared to what a manager high. It's anybody with a brain can learn how to manage that kind of stuff. It's really way more about how to deal with people. You know, and there's a lot of PR when you're a coach. You got to have parent meetings and all of that kind of stuff approximates a lot of the skills that you're going to have to, you know, expand on uh, once you move into an administrative role. Uh, you you got to own the decisions. You got to you have to own the fact. Like as a teacher, you're never really perceived as the face of the of the world history uh, department. You become the face of something. You become the face of the you know boys basketball program. You know, Marcus, you're the face of the boys basketball program of McCollum. Anything that happens there, whether it's the best player on the varsity team or the weakest player on the freshman team, ultimately comes back to you. And so, again, it doesn't make you it doesn't make you necessarily more aligned to being a great administrator, but the experience definitely preps you for it. Great words, um, Coach Avi. I was there at the TABC clinic when you spoke. Oh, thanks. You know, it was a pleasure to watch you speak. You know. Um, you know, Coach Hurley was there that year, Coach Huggins. You know, you guys uh, speaking on the same stage. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about that experience and what it meant to you. It was unbelievable. I can't remember the coach's name that was before me, um, but I, I made reference that he, I, he, he had lost 11 games in the last five years, and I lost 12 the previous year, <laughs> you know. Um, and then, you know, Shaka Smart, Bob Hurley Sr., Bob Huggins, you know, and I'm sure people were looking at the thing going, who in the hell is this guy, <laughs> you know, um, but it was awesome. So um, I, I had been blessed. I've been blessed over my career. I've coached uh, five different 2000 plus scores in, in my career. So the topic was developing scores. And I just went through a bunch of the things that we did to, to get kids, um, used to, to, to scoring the ball and, um, and, uh, you know, so I was sitting with my back to the crowd. And then when I went up to hook up my laptop and I looked out, I went, wow, <laughs> you know, there's a thousand people out there and over there's Bob Hurley and in the back is Bob Huggins. And so I figured if I just start off with, you know, with that kind of the joke, you know, joking about it. Um, and that helped ease the, nerves. you know, easy, ease my uh, nerves a little bit. And then once I just started talking hoops, I just started talking hoops and, and, um, and uh, I actually um, ran into coach Huggins later and he was like, he's like, you know, he goes, he goes, you were fantastic. And, and I was just like, wow. And, you know, and a lot of some of the drills that I, was going over, I stole from Bob Hurley Sr., you know, maybe adapted him a little bit, and Coach Hurley came up and talked to me, and, um, you know, we talked, and I'm from the East Coast, and he said, well, if you're ever that way and you want to come up and see what we do in the summer, and then I just never had a chance to do it. Um, it was uh, it was um, really a, a great day, and um, I had over 300 – coaches throughout the state that emailed me for the presentation and, and the stuff. So um, made old ball coach feel pretty good. Um, it was a lot of fun. And fortunately I've never had a big fear of public speaking. So that helped a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. It was good. It was good. You had some good stuff. Uh, I remember when, when Huggins went up, he, uh, I have, I was sitting in the front row. I like to be attentive and pay attention. And so um, he was drawing on the old school, uh, what is it? The projector with the with the with the yeah. marker, and I happened to be like right next to where the only place you could plug it in, and he needed to demonstrate something. I just remember, uh, so I stood up. He pulled me up, and I stood up, and he just was demo. I forgot what it was, but he took his forearm and just put it right in my chest. Like I wasn't <laughs> ready for it. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, I was a little sore the next day. No, I'm kidding. But uh, well, at least he didn't put you on the treadmill. Yeah, yeah that's what Pick a say, Bill. Did, <laughs> did he have a name for that thing? <laughs> He named it. About, I forgot what he yeah. said. He just said, "Go see so and so." But it was the yeah, track. go see something. Yeah, I can't remember what he said. It was pretty funny. Forty-five seconds at at level ten on the treadmill. He goes, "That'll take care of all your problems." <laughs> uh, really do well, I think coach, the days are short coming where you can do it in college. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that too, uh, Ryan. Yeah. 
the different world these days, I guess. Yep. And talking about uh, Coach Hurley, too, there was another thing that was funny to me was you had a great presentation, slideshow, and, and he had all of his notes on paper. And he was saying, I got a lot of great stuff here. I just don't know how to get it to you guys. So um, I might have to go and ask someone how to get everything from this sheet of paper to, to this computer. And then, and then I can email everybody. <laughs> Real old school about it. Yeah. That's Coach Huggins, man. All right, guys. Best basketball game that you've ever been a part of as a coach, thinking back in your career. Is there any chance I could say two? You can say as many as you want. You have to charge him. If he hits two, it's like a $5 fee or something. $5 fee? I'll yeah. pay it. Okay. Believe it or not, one of them was an AAU game. So back in the day when I was coaching AAU, the tournament, on the girls' side anyway, in Texas was the Whataburger Classic at A&M. And it was always around the 4th of July. I had taken teams up there in the past and, you know, like we might get out of pool play. And I think one year we finished in the sweet 16. Well, my last year I was loaded. I had, I mean, it was the easiest team I ever coached. i had every high school's best player or players on my team. Um, Anissa Hastings, um, Eva Christian, my daughter, Nicole Brantley, um, uh, Rachel Ross. I mean, you, I just – every kid that was on my roster had a college scholarship somewhere, either from, from NAIA all the way to NCAA Division One. And we were playing Team Texas in the uh, semis. And they had uh, – they had uh, Nikki Newton, who went to TCU. They had Heather Schreiber. They had – every one of their kids had signed, but they had a bunch of – Big 12, you know, Division One signees. And uh, we ended up winning that game 107-104 in uh, regulation. And, and, and I just remember I just sat there and it was just like I, – I was like, wow, I've never seen this many – uh, basketball players of that caliber on the floor at one time. It helped that we won too. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, Anissa, Anissa Hastings was absolutely a beast in that game. And, and Eva Christian, who too many times when people talk about all-time greats in San Antonio, they don't mention Eva enough. Eva was ridiculous. And then, of course, there was the Del Rio game. Um, I don't know if you were still there or not. Were you still there, Ryan? Um, on the road? No, the one at our place where Jazz hit the half-court shot. No, that was after I left, I think. So, uh, it was us and Del Rio. We were the best two teams. We both were really good. We went down there, and they they they, they, they whooped us. They beat us about 15, and um, they played great. We didn't play great, and they were ready, and we weren't. But then a funny thing happened. Laredo United upset them. So, when they came to our place – it was basically going to be – it was the last game of the district schedule, winner take all for district title. And um, Shauna Holmes <laughs> was sitting on my bench um, in a boot um, with cast – with a cast – I mean, in a boot with crutches. She had a real bad ankle sprain. She couldn't play. And game goes to double overtime. And then Shatavia Boomfudge fouls out about 45 seconds in and then – they just slowly start creeping on us. So it gets to 21 seconds left in the game. We're down six. And I am on the sideline, and I am just nuts. You know, it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, hey, Bill, stop lying to these girls. This game is over. Yeah. So we get the ball. My little sophomore point guard, I just decide we're not going to shoot three. I said, just go score. And they let her score call our last time out, and uh, ran through some the scenarios and this, that, and the other. They inbound the ball. Del Rio's point guard, who was just fabulous, she takes about two dribbles and dribbles the ball off of her foot, right? Ball rolls to me. Jazz looking at me, and I'm like, go score. Just go score. So Jazz goes again. She gets fouled, Right. I look up at the clock, 
there's 4.5 seconds left. So if they had just let her score, they would have had to inbound the ball, and we would have lost by two. So Jazz goes up, knocks down two shots. We foul right away. Their girl goes up two, 2.1 seconds, I think. Their girl goes up and uh, misses both free throws. The second one comes off long quick outlet to to my jazz my point guard she goes bounce bounce launches it from not our side but the 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 other side of the of the jump ball circle yeah and you the the, the del rio girls they're underneath our basket and they're they're like ah, you know and that ball banked in and we win by one I, I, it was like the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen in your life that one was pretty special too isn't it, isn't it pretty crazy how, like, sometimes in situations where you look up and you're like, you know, you're telling your team, hey, we got to do these things, even though you know it's it's slim to none that you have a good shot of winning. Things have to happen in your favor uh, on more uh, more situations than not, like the girl dribbling off her foot. Yeah. Free throws, you know, everything make- has to line up. But when it does, you know, those are some great memories. Yeah, it does. And, and the other thing is, is you don't ever want – your team to think you've given up on the game. Now, obviously, you're going to beat by 30, <laughs> you know. But, you know, you you don't ever want your players to think that you're not desperately trying to find a way to win that game. And, man, it was unbelievable, that game. What about you, Coach Patel? Uh, as much as I want to say that there's – it's a hard um, thing to say that would be dishonest. Um, it's a pretty clear cut cut and dried one for me as much as I value a lot of other wins that I had uh Bill was there uh and that was my second year at Southwest we were had a good enough team to get to the regional tournament and uh played uh, a really good Judson team in the regional semifinals um and uh but it 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 really like it, it was one of those kind of things where as you all the ingredients going into the game as you looked at it like you knew it was a perfect setup for us to beat them. They were the best team in the region. Um, they and Wagner had plowed through. The, the, you know, Judson had beat Wagner both times that year in really good games. And then both of them had just plowed through the playoffs. Wagner had a couple of future NBA players um, on their team. And and so it was – everything about it was perfect. One, we had – what would happen, and Bill will attest to this, during that time with the way alignment was – we would play – we'd be a San Antonio school pre-district, right? We're playing all San Antonio schools. We're in tournaments. And then we would just disappear and go dark and just go south. Yeah. And the, the bus trips were exhausting, yeah. uh, you know, two two hours every time you got to go somewhere. But, like, we would pass out of the consciousness of, um, of what was happening in San Antonio basketball for a long period of time. And then we'd go in the playoffs and we went south. We're not even, you know, uh, even, you know, doing that kind of stuff where people are watching what we're doing. And what happened was, is, is I was, I had had three really good players um, that were straight up basketball players. And then what we had kind of worked into a rotation was that I put a couple of football players with them uh, that were just athletes and they would go really guard you. Um, They would just get after you. And so it just turned into this, all the pieces fit together and it took longer in the year for a chemistry to start. In fact, we didn't have the starting lineup set until the second half of district. Well, by this point, we're an afterthought in San Antonio. So Mike Wackers at, at Judson, one of the best coaches ever coached in San Antonio, period, a Hall of Famer. But he's not worried about Southwest. So in the meantime, they're both plowing through their playoff. Boom, 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 boom. And over at Wagner, you know, his, Mike's son is dominant, and they had a couple of guards that were just could flat out go. And, uh, and then – on the other side, you could feel the weight of Wagner coming. Like, yeah. you could see it. Like, wait a minute. These guys are getting better and better and better. And Jordan Clarkson scored another 30 points. And Andre Robertson had another 30 rebounds. And, and so you could see their eye being drawn, right? Like, they had two battles in district. So they're not even looking at us. And you know Mike and his staff is like, you got to take them seriously. you got to take them seriously. you got to take them seriously. But they don't have good scouting report on us. They don't know that in the meantime, Reggie Olendyke, who was way better at player development than me, had taught those two football kids how to shoot. <laughs> and they, 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 you know, Kendrick Robinson was such a, a tremendous scorer of the basketball. Mm-hmm. They gross, and he was, he's one of the best scorers to ever play basketball in San Antonio, period. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they grossly underestimated Ray Pastrano. 
uh, both ends of the floor and effort, Ray is the best player, high school player I ever coached. And so you could tell that because we kind of got dark, the scouting report when they went into the game was we just we just got to stop Robinson. If we stop him, that's the only, you know the only way he's going to beat us is if he has one of those games where he goes off for forty. Yeah. And that's not who we were. Yeah. So you know you know like hey Mike and his staff is like we got you know it, we got to be focused on this game, but the kids are looking across the gym. Wagner blows out. Um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember which one of the Valley schools they blew out in the in the game before us. Of course, we're on there watching them, and you can see the Judson kids talking about the game. Oh, so they're all not, in the same gym, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all in UTSA, and so you know the coaches are trying to get them to focus on us. But what ended up happening was you could tell the defensive game plan was like we're going to double we're going to double Robinson to get the ball out of his hand, and it was pretty it was really evident by the time we got to halftime that wasn't going to work. Yeah. So, but halftime we were up, I think eight or nine at half, and uh, so uh, another one of the assistants on the staff. <laughs> Bill knows why I'm already laughing. I know exactly. Another one of the assistants on the staff, a, a great guy and a great friend, um, Rob Thomas, Rob. still coaching. Yeah. Uh, Rob was Rob's always the gadget guy. Like yeah. he's the guy that would like coach a freshman team. And realized that he'd somehow turn the offense into nothing but like thirty sets, and they would all and they would all be super gimmicky, like where somebody rolls off something and dives or whatever. And so what Rob would do, and I hate to out Rob for those guys that still coach against him at the sub varsity level, but Rob would do the misdirection play coming out of halftime every game that he could. Yeah. So any time that his team had the ball coming out of half, he'd go ask the official, and then he would go and he would have his players go stand on the wrong end of the court and see if the other players would go stand by him. And he had been on me all year. He had been – so this is where you have to make square of the moment decision-making. Hmm. And I'm being, I'm being straight up with you right here, okay? This is straight up honest. So, so this is where you got to make strict spur of the moment decision-making. So he'd been on me all year. Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. District game. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. No, nah, Rob, we're not doing that. Nah. So then I started telling well, we'll wait till it's a big game. But I'm really just saying that to pacify him, to shut him up. That's why I was saying it. Like, I'm not running that – and then all of a sudden, like all the stars in the universe come together and he makes a beat. We go to halftime, like F8 or 9 or whatever, and he makes the beeline to the scores table to ask whose ball it is coming out of half. And he goes straight to me with the most intense look I've ever seen in his face. It's our ball. And I just looked at him. And then right now, I didn't make the decision until right then. I said, go draw it up. <laughs> and so he goes in there. And so, you know, we talk about adjustments and what we're going to do. And, and he goes in and draws it up. And we go out there, and, and he tells one of the, the, the referees, hey, look, we're going to fix the run a little something here, so y'all don't need to be coaching. Y'all are referees. Yeah. And to their credit, that crew, I believe they were out of Fort Worth. They did kept their mouth shut. One of the referees even whispers to me, he goes, oh, my gosh, it's going to work. And so what they had done is they doubled Kendrick, yeah. and so he hadn't scored much. Now, Ray had scored on them, and, and Mark Hall and Paris Johnson had hit threes, and and, and Justin Alexander had got some good uh, putbacks and stuff in the lane, but Kendrick had only had like four points. Well, sure enough, they go for it. And we inbound the ball to Kendrick. The, Mike's son was so dang smart. He was such a good player that the last minute he saw it and sprinted down there. So Kendrick had to take a little bit of a – about a 10-foot bank shot. But for that kid, that was like a layup. Yeah. And then he ends up scoring like 14 that quarter, that quarter because – Got him going. Uh, yeah, we got him going. And then on top of that, um, they couldn't double him anymore. So the game plan was to double him. So they started trying to single guard him, but they hadn't repped it. Yeah. So he starts lift, lifting up and making threes over the top of people. And so it was a great game. They came back and almost got it at the end, but got that win and got our opportunity to get our butts kicked by Wagner the next day. So, I Yeah, I, that was I, – I was sitting at the game with uh, Joanne, with Dr. Fay, and um, James Sullivan, our, one of our board members who's all about athletics. Yeah, he is. And I saw you guys come out, and I went, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And they were like, what? I said, don't you see what's going on here? What basket are we supposed to be going to? And then Joanne was like, and then she's like, that worked. <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. I, I've told Ryan many times, the, just the guts oh my to God. do that at the regional tournament in that game. But he was so right. It got Kendrick going. And, and the other thing was, we were just playing Big time. a little bit of a chip, but like look a little bit of a chip, um, and we don't have anything to lose, and we can beat you guys. Yeah. Um, and they did. It was it was a remarkable game. 
and where we were as a team, like for us to be either of those teams, we were going to have to have a normal game plan cycle. We were going to have to be able to have a couple of practices, look at film, talk specifics. That's what those kids needed. That What we had developed defensively is a really tailored plan where we just guarded every, every team we played a little different based on on what they could do. Yeah. And so I knew we were – it wasn't a good matchup. Like, like Judson was a good matchup, but Wagner with them running waves of players and really pressed us when we weren't very deep at guard was going to be tough. But I felt like if we had if, – if we had that one – that semifinal game, if we had a chance to really game plan the way our kids had gotten used to and put in a defensive game plan. The other thing I, that I did that was completely uh, off the charts, I never did anything else like it, but we had scouted them so much and had so much film on them. And I'd never seen their point guard. He's a really solid player, but I'd never seen their point guard take anything but a layup. He'd taken one three in a game against East Central, and, he, and it didn't look good. Yeah. And so, and and because I, you know, I had Kendrick out here there wanted to score, but didn't really want to guard anybody. Um, what we did was I told him, I said, look, you're going to mirror that guy and you're going to have one foot in the paint. The whole, it looked like, look, looked like somebody playing little dribblers basketball, but it disrupted their whole offense in the first half because, because he's trying to, Mike's trying to run his offense largely through his son and you got one guard just standing in the paint. Yeah. And the poor kid, the point guard, I felt bad because it's like, it's almost like calling him out. He finally tried one three. It looked terrible. It, it had was no cool. chance. Kind of there was like Ben Simmons these days. <laughs> do what? Like the way they guard Ben Simmons. These yeah, days. correct. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, there was a moment in the second half of that game where we had a uh, Pastrano had a penetration and he kicked it out to Mark Hall, one of those two kids that played football, yeah. and they're one of their kids covered out and Mark shot a three over the top of him and they fouled him and he made a four point play and I'll never forget turning around towards the bench and Matt Elliott, who was the athletic director, was standing because Matt was such a nervous person. And he would like was so invested in that game. Like he just needed us to win. And uh he jumped and almost landed on top of the chairs on our bench when that ball went in. It was just like it's still grained in my mind. That was like, what are you, I was like, what are you doing, crazy man? You're gonna land on somebody. And and that was such a huge shot because the momentum was changing. Yeah. Judson it was. That was it wasn't a big run, but they were inching inching yeah. back in. They were chipping away. And then boom, a four point play opened it back up to about eight. Yeah, Not, probably Ryan eight nine. Yeah, it was uh, right towards the beginning of the fourth quarter. Yeah, it was it was something special from one of the kids, like you said that that wasn't a great shooter early on in the year, uh, but that player development was was huge for sure. You know, and uh, you go back to talking about Reggie, which you know, I mean, I think everybody in this uh, meeting knows that when Reggie hung up his shoes, he was one of the best basketball coach. You could make a heck of an argument that he was the best boys basketball coach in the city. Although there's a lot of really talented coaches around. But the one thing I'll tell you when you start working with your staff, if you have the ability to hire complimentary people, you don't always have that because you got to have – got pain in the butt principles like me telling you what teaching field you got and all this kind of stuff like that. Finding complimentary pieces, you know, what I was decent at was the ability to take the players I had, figure out how to put them together in a way that gives us the best chance to be successful, and then game plan opponents. But Reggie was so much better a player development guy than me. And, you know, and, and, it's, and when I hired him, I knew it. Um, and then the more that we worked together, the more I just, you know, started giving him practice sessions to go work with guards on things based on deficiency. And, and the more, I mean, I would sit literally, like there was times in the second half of the district, I would send Reggie with just those two guys. Yeah. So we, we would do stuff with everybody else, and he would just have those two guys working on angles and getting their hips right, hands right, all that kind of stuff, because they were good athletes. They just hadn't got the reps. Uh, shooting the basketball, but those two players combined for eight threes that game. Oh wow! Now they were wide open, except for the one that Mark got fouled on. Yeah. They were they were the kind of threes you give a guy if you think they can't make. Them. Yeah, and that's how you know that that was the game plan, and it was scouted that way. And yes, sir, kept giving it to him. You know, going back to Reggie, uh, I mean, I credit so much to uh, to him and and what I've learned as a coach. Um, you're right. I mean, he was a heck of a a player development kind of guy. And, and what I learned too was he wasn't afraid to try something and be wrong. You know, like in practice, he'd say, let's, let's give us a look. Um, I think it'd be really good. Um, we're going to work on these things. And then um, at the end of it is, you know, Marcus, nah, I, I don't think it's going to be good for us. So let's, let's, let's re, re, uh, rethink that, you know, so he wasn't afraid to, to, uh, to try something that he wasn't sure of. Um, and, and, and sometimes it would work. Like when we had uh, Burns, 
you know, let's let's try working these things with him. We we never had a player like Jordan before, right? And um, and and some things didn't work, and 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 obviously he ended up finding the things that did, and they had that heck of a run. Um, but he wasn't afraid to put himself out there, and and he didn't always, you know, some guy don't he didn't always act like he knew everything. He was willing to give something a try. Right. So, uh, so we got a uh, YouTube guy who's worked together for a few years on the, on the boys side and the girls side. Uh, just talk a little bit about some of the things that you guys did to make that uh, relationship uh, work well and in and, and harmony. Well, I'll speak to that first, Bill, if you don't mind. The, um, um, so when I came in uh, to Southwest, um, you know, I'm coming in really quite frankly as an outsider. Um, I was not from San Antonio. I had no real connection to Southwest. And, you know, I come in there and um, – one of the first, you know, few days I'm on campus and walking around, Bill's on campus, and so I get introduced to him. And the first thing he says is, say, hey, coach, I need to ask your permission on something. I'm like, okay, and, you know, what would you ask my permission for? He said, so the girls' locker room layout is not functional for a male coach. And uh, Coach Casper, the previous head coach, had worked with me to let me office out of y'all's office. Um and, uh, but you know, it's still your office, you know, I mean, if you want me out of there, I'll go over to the girl's side. Um, but it just works a lot better because it's, you know, still right by the gym and, yeah. and, and that way I don't have to worry about constantly trying to be careful and protect the privacy of my, of my players as I come and go. And, um, of course for me, that's a no brainer. And I think what, what's at the core of that, um, for both of us is so like, like like true respect is something that you develop over a course of relationship, but there's a fundamental baseline respect that if you both people start the relationship with, it's probably going to work. Um, I just viewed bill and quite frankly, all, all the other basketball coaches, the ones that I coached against everything else as being the guys in the world that understood my job and knew what I was going through. And so I think from the very beginning, even though I wasn't a Southwest guy at that time, and I wasn't even a San Antonio guy, uh, Bill welcomed me from the very beginning, and I was just appreciative to have uh, somebody that could talk ball and was also welcoming of me. And so, you know, so be- because that, like, you, here's the deal: like, there's a lot of you can you've seen bad relationships between boys, uh, boys and girls basketball coaches. You share facilities; that that's a built-in opportunity to to bicker. It's hard to bicker with somebody who's demonstrated that they really care about you the way Bill demonstrated he cared about me and understands what you go through when you have that mutual understanding you're like you know what I really want to do x but I get it fair is is this um and so I'm gonna I'm gonna flex and work with you and honestly I don't remember a single time where you and I ever had a even a second of conversation about what Jim or whatever we just it never was an issue it never was it, it was it was really um special and um and and what I found is is Ryan and I both have very similar personalities we, we're going to respect everybody first and then out of that that respect came a a lifelong friendship I mean every once in a while um we'll still call each other or text yep. each other and and you know uh we you know we had we don't see each other as we used to obviously when we worked in the same building um but those are special years and and Reggie was there and and it was it was special years and we got really good before he left, but like my first year there, we were kind of rebuilding, but you know, we won a playoff game that year. We got to the playoffs, won a playoff game. Um, and it was really special for me to sit there and watch the work they were putting in. And then for them to get to a regional tournament, um, it was great. And, 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 and when I say this, I'm not bragging in any way, shape or form, but most of the years when I was at Southwest, our boys program was, eh, Sometimes not very good, sometimes average, um, and uh, we were always usually pretty good. Um, and it was just really cool having both programs so good. And then, like I say, Ryan, Ryan and I, we we've had late night till four o'clock in the morning conversations about life, not just about b- basketball. And um, I used I, I still tell people all all the time the the the, the smartest man I've ever ever known is Ryan Pertel. Oh, gosh. He's, he is so smart. He's ridiculous. And 
um, it was just a special time and, and he, he's a special friend and I really, really value the relationship more than I can articulate. Same. Absolutely. Couldn't say it better. Just to add to that, uh, um, Reggie also claims you as the smartest human being on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill and Reggie need to get out more. That's all I can say. <laughs> I used, right, to tell, guys, um, I used to tell Ryan all the time, I'm a really smart guy, but I'm not, I'm not as smart as you. Well, I've met a lot of smart people, right? Uh, and, and I'm sure uh, you have and Reggie has, but, but you both claim uh, Ryan Pertel to be the smartest, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride with that too. <laughs> you, uh, you've you been in the business for a long time, you know, education and coaching. Uh, so just talk about some impactful moments and moments that you've had in your career. Hmm. Well, where you realize, you know, this is more than the job. This is, a, you know, relationships and life kind of thing. You know, um, I, 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 tend to, I tend to snap to, to coaching moments on that more than anything. Um, and uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, God was good to me in the sense that um, I was looking for a job um, with a chance to, to have some success and to find some kids that were into winning in basketball as much as I was when I came to Southwest. But what was the very best thing uh, was to, to put me in the middle of a community that was very different than me, um, that was way more ethnically diverse, culturally diverse um, than what I had been exposed to. Um, not that I, you know, that I was not, not in with no diversity prior to that, but, you know, going to the to the south side of San Antonio when you've lived mostly in Fort Worth in Dallas area uh, is is definitely a different scenario. And to go into that situation, and this is why I say God was good to me because you start working with kids that don't all come from the best background that that have some hurdles at home um, that you're not familiar working with is the eye opening experience that every educator, regardless of your job. If you ain't, if you haven't done it, you need to do it. Um, because, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I fell in love with those kids. Absolutely loved them and had to learn how to work with them, had to learn to move past, uh, feeling sorry for what's going on with them and then helping coach them to try to help them overcome the things that are happening in their lives. Uh, you know, it was one of the hardest lessons I've ever learned was like feeling bad for what's happening to a kid or what he's going through doesn't help the kid, you know? You got you to gotta help them break a whatever cycle of negativity that's in their life. Uh, and so, I, you know, I just felt and, – and that wasn't just the kids in, in, in basketball. That was the kids in the classroom. Um, and so the irony now is, is that, as I said, as a campus principal, um, I have openly pursued uh, opportunities to be in a role that I, the exact job I'm in, where I'm in a community where, where you know, the poverty rate is significant and kids do have something, and that's – a big part of my why and what I do. But yet until I walked in the door at Southwest, my exposure to that, my eyes were open. I'm going to, you, to put it to you like that, uh, to experience that and to see it. And, and now it's driven my career to the place where it's at, where the, you know, one of my biggest things that I do is to try to break the cycle of generational poverty. Anything that we can do as a campus and as a system to help break that cycle, that's a, a big driving force. And it started from coaching. And quite frankly, it was at Southwest. Um, for me, um, coach, um, on the basketball side, every year it just floored me how many of our girls came from uh, single parent homes. And I was not ever trying to be their father, but it was my responsibility to be a positive male role model for them. Um, so that was, that was an ongoing every year, um, thing that, that really, meant a lot to me and the, the players that still keep in touch with me and invite invited, you know, invite me to weddings and baptismals of their kids. Um, that, that kind of makes me think that maybe I did something right there. Um, the other thing, um, for me, like, like coach said, I, you know, I got into this thing to coach basketball. Um, but I became a pretty good teacher too and um they put me 
in with the senior testers. So I did it for a decade now. I never had one kid not pass the, the test. And this was long before Senate Bill 149. Kids graduate. had to pass the test. They didn't graduate. And the challenges of that, the relationships that were formed, the, the joy of these kids when they would pass that test and they would learn they're going to graduate priceless. You know, I actually, I, you know, Bill's a heck of a lot better teacher than I am and that's not false humility. In fact, now that I've really developed a, a pretty robust instructional philosophy, I, I have this weird fantasy of going back and teaching in the classroom and, <laughs> and doing it now. Uh, but Bill was a much better teacher than I was. And that's just a fact. Um, however, thank I do you remember, that, thank you. Yeah, no, he was. Um, but the, um, that's Principal Patel, Principal Patel evaluating Teacher A.V. and Teacher Patel. Okay. A.V. is the better teacher. So anyway, um, the uh, but I do remember something similar to that. I remember the first year because I was teaching U.S. History at at at, um, at Southwest during that same era where you either passed them all or you didn't graduate. And watching those kids, they, you know, we already got their test results, but they didn't know we had them, mm -hmm. you know. And watching them, like, be tardy to class to come by the classroom and say, Coach, I passed, you know. I'm like – Wow, that's awesome. Pretend like I didn't know, you know, and, and that's, that's pretty special. I had, I had a, a girl and I was um, an ELL student. Um, she was dyslexic and she worked so hard. And that day that those scores came in and I was upset because the counselors needed to let me tell those kids. And after this year, that changed. I was standing up teaching the class and the door flings open right and comes in like uh kramer on seinfeld <laughs> and she goes coach coach i passed <laughs> oh i mean she was so excited i mean it's it, you know it's just stuff like that that you can't you, you, you there's no monetary number you can put on it um it's all about helping kids and one of the ap's i work with right now He's a Southwest product, went to Indian Creek, went to McAuliffe, graduated from Southwest High School. And he has a saying, he's like, our kids want to be great. They just need somebody to be their champion. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I just love the way that he says that. And, um, and so our Southwest ISD kids, they're just great kids and they want to be successful. And, um, you know, people like Ryan, hopefully like myself and many others, hopefully we've, we've, um, been able to help, help, help those kids. Sure. So you guys have been out of coaching for a little bit. Um, before we call this one a day, just tell me a little bit about what you missed the most about coaching. Um, I would say, there's nothing quite like the, 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 the team competitive dynamic. And that involves your coach, yourself, your, your assistants, and your players. Mm -hmm. What happens when you get that, that collection of human beings and we're all, you know, really nuanced and really different and have our different perspectives on things. But to get a group of about, you know, 15 people to work together over a, you know, if you focus just on the season over a four month period towards one goal, mm -hmm. um, there's nothing really like that. Um, there's a lot of things that, that I do in my role as a principal now that, that are similar to that. Um, but not at that level of the personal level that you develop with a team. It's just the camaraderie. It's as much, and it's all of you like, well, you know, people talk about, well, you missed the, the, the coach's office or you miss this out of the other. It's all of it. It's the, it's the, it's the serious game planning conversations and it's the joking around. It's, you know, it's the, the hard practices where the, you know, the kids are not, you know, their, their focus is not where you want it and you got to push them. And then it's the, you know, it's the bus ride. Um, it's all that stuff. Um, it's just that general group dynamic camaraderie um, that, that you, you still miss now the, the 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 my focus now is not, is not the same. It's not something that I would that I'm gonna go back to. I'm, I'm my my direction has changed, but 
I still remember – and what's funny is you go to all three of the high schools I've worked at, Warren High School, O'Connor High School, and now Stevens. And the coaches on the coaches staff will say from time to time, Pertel pops in and within five seconds you can't tell whether he's an administrator or a coach. Um, I was joking around. We just we just uh, hired a new defensive coordinator. Actually, I promoted a guy on our, our staff. And uh, I was walking around, and the, some of our coaches were on campus for strength and condition, walking with a mask on, and, and they happened to be standing there. And, and I, the head coach is standing there, and the defensive coordinator said, and I said, hey, Coach Landeros, hey, just to let you know, I don't know if they told you, but uh, one of the things is is when we play football, they need to have a, be sending two guys every down. Like we're blitzing from somewhere all the time. You know, and I'm telling him, like, I want, the, I want the safety walking down, coming through the A-gap. That's what I want. And the head coach is shaking his head like, no. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. We're, <laughs> hey, I, I, I want all the plays to be either a blow them up in the backfield, sack fumble, or a touchdown. Yeah. You know, and so you just – you snap back into that stuff because it's in you. And I'll it's always like Brady, be coach. It's like Brady Conger now. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's, that was actually Brady's defense. But the uh, – um, very successful at it at that matter. But the uh, – um, no, but uh, uh, that's in you, and it's never out of you, you know, that, that camaraderie that you get. The number one thing for me is the camaraderie um, that the coach was referring to. Um, and what I miss the most is practice, is, is practice. I got there the last couple of years of my, of, of my – before I stopped, I, the games were – it just, you know, there's only so many times you can get on a bus, drive two and a half hours to play a game, get some free pizza and come home. The games were get really grinding. What I really miss is practice. I miss teaching the game, teaching the life lessons that go with playing the game and playing the game properly. Um, but the camaraderie is, is, is still there. So people ask me all the time, do I miss it every day? I miss it every day. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I'm ready to go back to it right now. Uh, I know my family probably isn't ready for me to go back to it. Um, but, you know, we'll see, we'll see where I go in a few years when I retire. And um, I could see myself if I get opportunity, maybe to go to a private school or something, maybe someday getting back in the game or doing some training or working with an AAU program. Um, that's just how of much of a fanatic of coaching basketball I am. Hey, Marcus, I was thinking about something as we got ready to go into this that um, I think a lot of people that, especially who are in the coaching ranks, that would if you got a, a person as a, a, a 6A high school principal sitting in the meeting would maybe want to hear about, but I'm going to set myself up for that if you don't mind because uh, I, I get asked it a lot. Um, and that is, you know, what do you look for now that you're in a position where you're the final say on who's going to be a, a head boys, head girls basketball coach or, or any other sport. What is it that you look for? Um, and there's so many different things, right? Um, but the biggest thing that I would say to encourage uh, coaches, young coaches trying to be moved from the assistant role to the head coaching position or guys that have got a head coaching job but, but need a better one because the one they're at is really not going to give them a good opportunity to compete. Um, is what they got to understand is when you when you think about yourself in relation to position and you have any kind of confidence in yourself, you tend to be real focused, self focused. I know I was, and if you have any kind of confidence, you believe you can go do it. On the other side of that, what I can tell you is thoughtful people spend most of their time thinking about fit. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is, there's a lots of guys that can coach, but not everybody is the right fit for every school, and that can change over time. Um, you know, I feel like I was the right fit for Southwest High School when I came in there. I don't know that I would have been the right fit for Southwest High School six years later. Yeah. Um, and so I think fit's a big part of it. So you guys that are out there, you guys and, and, and gals out there that are trying to push through, if you're not getting jobs, just keep working hard. Yeah. You're going to find the right fit. And the worst thing to do is to push yourself into the wrong fit because you're going to end up with a, a bad situation. You're going to be unhappy. People are going to be unhappy. Um, and so don't do that. And to that point, this is where I told you I was kind of setting it up. There probably has not been a better fit hire in San Antonio basketball in my memory than you're hired in McCollum. And, and I know that the people in your community know this, but I'm going to say it anyway, and they can listen. And if anyone's out there that don't disagree with it, they can come talk to me about it. Um, but, but you're incredibly rare. 
So most people um, that are want to be head coaches are, are kind of coaching mercenaries to a degree. I was, Bill was when he came to Southwest, then, then Southwest got in his blood and he didn't leave. But we were all looking for the right opportunity. Uh, I don't know of many people that follow your path, Marcus. And there's a reason why people are so drawn to your love of the game. To have the opportunity to hire a guy who grew up in a community and in that community fell in love with a sport, it's just a, it's just a game. I mean, right? Like, it's just a game. But you fell in love with it there, and then you set yourself on a path and a pattern to qualify yourself to come back and knowing from day one that that was your dream job, that you weren't talking about how you could go try to get a job at this part of the other side of the city or the other part of the state, that you wanted to go back to the community where you were from and then make the kids that grow up in the subsequent generations love basketball the way that you love basketball in the McCullum community. If I'm the principal of McCullum High School, if I'm the superintendent of Harlandale ISD, if I'm the AD, you are worth your weight in gold, sir, because that does not grow on trees. There's a lot of guys out there that if they came to McCollum and won a lot, they'd be looking for the next opportunity. And I'm not blaming them. That's not a judgment. I did that. So to have somebody to say, I am straight up, ride or die, McCollum, we're going to go and make this be the best we can be. And when we're up, we're going to be up. And if we get a little bit down, we're going to get down. Dude, I'm just, and that's a principle talking. That ain't, they, it's not somebody that knows you as friends is biased. Yeah. That's, I'm telling you, that's a principle talking. I can't, I hope they realize what they got. I'm sure they do. Here, but I hope here. they realize what they got. Here, here, Ryan. I, 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 every word you said, I echo wholeheartedly. Um, Marcus is just a special, special guy, man. I mean, he, yeah. if they don't know what they have, I'm sure they do. Yeah, I'm sure they do. I mean, the work you do in that community, that alumni game you put on. I mean, it's just you are so ingrained in that community, and um, and God bless you for it. And uh, and believe me when I tell you. Unless you're playing, uh, you know, Legacy High School right now, I'm rooting for you pretty much every game. Same. Well, we are now district opponents, so it's going to have to be a little less friendly. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that means the world to me, especially coming from you two guys, and, and, and I respect everything you say and everything that you've done in your careers. And, and so your word uh, is gold to me as well. So I, I, I genuinely appreciate what you just said. Uh, for I'm, sure. Pretty speechless right now, so thank you very much. <laughs> and and just to, to top it off, I appreciate you guys taking the time. I think it's been about an hour, 15, hour and a half almost. Um, but it was fun. It didn't feel like an hour. Just No, it, it was great seeing you guys again. And um, especially Ryan, I don't I, I don't hardly ever see him anymore. And and <laughs> um, it, it was awesome. Thank you, Marcus, for setting us up. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Same, Marcus. Yes, sir. You guys stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, be careful out there, and uh, if there's anything I can do for you guys, even if it's not basketball-related, just let me know. Absolutely. Likewise, sir. Thank you. You guys have a good day. All right. Later.